The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, IRS Limited, ABN 47060313359, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to Advice 2030, where we explore the future of financial advice. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and in this series, we're diving into the seven megatrends identified in a joint report by Deloitte and Iris. But before we look to the future, we're starting with how advisors are already using technology to boost efficiency and create great client experiences right now. Throughout the series, we'll also hear from Iris leadership about how they're turning insights from the report into action and what's coming up next on the product roadmap. So let's get started. Could your business take on 30 more clients? Through X-Plan, IRS is on a mission to help advice businesses boost efficiency and free up capacity. The goal? To help our industry get ready for the $2.1 billion advice opportunity revealed in the Big Shift research and to help bring more advice to more Australians. X-Plan, unmatched in advice technology. Welcome back to our podcast series, folks, where we've been exploring the future of financial advice and the key trends that will reshape our industry. Today's episode is all about collaboration, working together to navigate the significant shifts on the horizon. Very excited to have Kelly Wilmer, Executive General Manager of Wealth at Iris. That's a serious title. Here to unpack how Iris is thinking about these disruptors that we're all going to face and what it means for their product roadmap. Kelly, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's exciting. It is. Before we dive into the themes of our discussion, I'd love to um, share you know, a brief overview of your role at Iris. That is a serious title, so I'd love to hear what that actually means. Um, and of course, you know, what brought you here? Like, What was your journey to, to this position at Iris? Yeah, so EGM of Wealth, I lead the Wealth Business Unit at Iris. Uh, so essentially, my team uh, takes care of all the clients who utilize X-Plan. Okay. Uh, and that can be from using that through a licensee through to using it direct with us as well. Okay. Uh, and so my time, I've been at Iris for the last 10 years, uh, but I've been in wealth for about you know, 20 plus years, yeah. I'd say. Um, that gen- generally is the term for most people in wealth. <laughs> yes. Uh, so 20 plus years uh, have been in practices where I've helped to manage practices, okay. uh, financial planning pra- practices who actually use X-Plan, yep. um, helping them to streamline their business practices, uh, as well as them working in institutions. Uh, I think most people do their tenure at BT Financial Group at one point <laughs> yes. in time. So I was within the wealth arm of uh, BT. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, this is my second time at Iris, actually. Okay. Yeah, I originally uh, was at Iris probably about 15 or so years ago as an account manager and a training executive. So I may have trained some of the okay. users of x long-term users. Yep. Uh, and then I went off and did my tenure at BT, et cetera, uh, and then came back to Iris. Uh, have been leading commercial teams at Iris uh, when I first rejoined right. uh, and then supporting the global commercial team in their ways of working and driving business efficiencies internally and the way that they worked uh, with our clients. Yep. Uh, and then with the most recent uh, transformation and the restructure that came from that, an opportunity to come back into the wealth team directly and, and then to lead the wealth team. Wow. And I'm, I'm sure it must be interesting with that sort of background where you've got quite some time with Iris versus, say, Kerry's, who we've spoken to, who is relatively new. Does that work quite well, having sort of newer faces or, or newer ways of looking things come into the team combined with your deeper understanding and sort of historical understanding of the business? Yeah, absolutely. Having fresh eyes on how we we do things. Uh, bringing their experiences in, especially people like Kerry. Uh, and we've got quite a few people who have joined who've come from the industry into Iris. So they right. know uh, what the challenges are for advisors and, and their business uh, and their users of X-Plan. Yeah. Uh, they know where the pain points are and they they essentially can speak the language of advisors. 
Right. And it, look, because it is a strange language, let's all admit. <laughs> sure, the listener would agree. There is a lot of a lot of uh, specialty things that go on in financial advice. I mean, you mentioned restructure, but also there has been a strategic shift, haven't, mm-hmm. hasn't there, in Iris? Um, really looking be- beyond sort of reactive legislative changes, which we all have to deal with and probably are exhausted from, and looking at these sort of significant shifts that could really alter the way we all even give advice or what the advice is which I think is something probably none of us have really considered up until this point because we've been reacting mm. to what's been going on. And I think that thinking is quite innovative for an advice tech business. So I'm curious, how did that come about? Like what was what was the moment where we went, you know what, let's imagine what's going to happen in the future. Well, I think it's part of it's because we – being involved in the industry for so long and supporting the industry for so long, we've seen all the changes. Mm. And I think as we went through Royal Commission and all the changes that came through that, uh, and and there's been a multitude of changes since then, yeah. uh, it, it felt like it was doom and gloom you for did. the industry. Yeah. You know, advisor numbers dropping, uh, you know, costs of running a business, profitability seemed it wasn't there. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, it didn't seem like there was a great deal of opportunity but being on the tech side, we felt that there had to be opportunity. Yeah. There's there's more Australians that needed advice. There's and you can just look at the amount of Australians that that we have. Yeah, they are all going to need advice at some point. Now, to what level will depend on where they're at in their stage of life. Yeah. So we we actually that led us to the partnership with Deloitte. We we wanted to prove out the point, rightly or wrongly, mm. and, and and luckily here we are rightly proven. <laughs> that there is opportunity yeah. for advice. Uh, and so from that, we, we spent a great deal of time with Deloitte. Uh, we surveyed a lot of advisors and then that's what's driven uh, the Advice 2030 report, Yep, the big shift. Yeah. And it's an interesting perspective because you're so right. It's just like when you, if you watch the news too much, right? It's just, oh, the world's horrible. Mm. It clearly isn't horrible. There's some horrible things happening, but it's not. And I think advice is the same, or even financial services. If we only watch our press or what's what's out there, we're going to just think it's all negative, and it simply isn't. The more you talk to advisors, I mean, the, I'm encountering so many advisors who now have wait lists for clients. Like, I don't remember a time when that was ever the case. Now, if there's ever a sign that there's an uptick in opportunity and advice, that's one of them. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean- what advisors used to, and, and I know when I started my career, and I was a client service administrator, mm. uh, so I would help to bring the clients on board yeah. uh, for my advisor. And you know, there was no picking or choosing of which clients they wanted to see. They no. were filling their books up. Uh, now they have choice, and yeah. I think that, I mean that's beneficial in the fact that they can choose who they work with. They can, yeah. and and so can the client. Like, is that the right advisor for them? So I think it will then help to have the right partnerships going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll dive into that actually because I think there really is some an interesting future for all of us that's quite exciting. So let's get into these disruptors. Um, not meaning to be negative, these things are just waves that are coming and we get to surf them or we get to drown under them, but I plan on surfing on them. But one of them that was interesting is, you know, the whole, so there's this skyrocketing rocketing retirement demand. We've got housing unaffordability, which is getting really noisy in the press too, understandably, but then also all this money that's going to transfer between the generations. That feels like a bit of a confluence of events to me. Like there's a whole lot that's intermingling there. And I think it's easy to get distracted by the impact on the younger generation when there's some poor schmucks in the 40s and 50s, like myself, put my hand up, who are going to get caught in the middle of all this and potentially even retire without their own home. You know, that's an interesting prospect. And it's not something I think many modeling for financial advisors have had to consider. What does all of that, and let alone the aging parents are going to have to look after, like there's so much in there, it's going to get quite complicated. How do you see this rolling out? I mean, there's got to be challenges for your product roadmap, right? Like what does that mean for how you roll things out in Iris? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, retirement planning has always been complex. Yeah, that's fair. It, it hasn't <laughs> simplified. It's just new dynamics that um, advisors have to face into. Yeah. But yeah, I think with the research, I don't think anyone would have thought that there were people in their 40s, late 40s and 50s and heading into retirement that wouldn't be owning their own home. Right. Uh, and these people, uh, and I think it's, we all thought it was the younger generation. Uh, they are resigned to never owning a home, especially not around the cities where they no, work. No, um, but for the for the older generation, they now have to consider, and advisors need to consider how do they invest for them because yeah. they still need a retirement nest egg. 
Yeah. Uh, and so where we're doubling down is on our tools because the tools are what drive the rights, thinking around how to generate that advice, what's the right uh, retirement scenarios to consider, uh, as well as product comparison as well. So we're doubling down on our X tools mod- uh, modeling tool, yeah. um, risk researcher as well, because yeah. one of the big shifts is around natural disasters right. and being able to be insured properly. Yes. Yes. Uh, as well as how do advisors um, work with their clients and be able to visualize this for them? And so th- yeah. that came with the appropriately named tool, Visualize, <laughs> uh, because most of the tools that we have are for back office. It's right. for advisors to model back at their desk yep. once they have all the information. Yep. It's for the power planners to use. But clients, potential, and especially a pen- potential clients, they want to see potentially what they're going to get from yes. the cost of the ongoing advice. Absolutely. So to have a, a client-facing tool that can give comfort to the potential client or the new client um, and strengthen that la- relationship as they move into an ongoing relationship. Yeah. the That's so important, isn't it? I mean, we call it in our practice uh, using the crystal ball. We're going to peer to the crystal ball and see what your future looks like. And it's so important because there are some big milestones people won't have considered. And an interesting one, if you've not got your own home, you're heading to retirement, what does age care look like? Because, mm-hmm. I mean, the home has always been that backup, hasn't it? It's like, well, at least you've got that. You know, you've got an asset, worst case, you could liquidate that asset. If you don't have that, you know, their backups are ma- like significantly reduced. Mm. Where is that funding going to come from? You know, and, and let alone the new retirement income streams products. And I mean, it's exciting. You know, I'm going to a lot of sessions are about those, but you're right, how we can represent that to the client in a way they can understand, absorb and make decisions around is really important. Well, retirement income stream products haven't traditionally been in our products. No. Uh, and so as, as a result of the research, we've been able to look into that crystal ball and say, what are advisors going to need? Yeah. And retirement income products need to be represented in our tools. So yeah. we're currently working on and as part of our discovery phases as to how we can build that in um, yeah. and allow advisors to use that. Because right now they're going to lots of different websites and trying to do comparisons on yeah. their own, yeah, uh, they should have a tool that allows them to do it really quickly and easily. Yeah, uh, and so we we will look to have that coming through in our roadmap, uh, and our aim is to have a solution uh, early next year. Yeah, fantastic. And look, it is I can understand why Explain wouldn't necessarily focus on that. I mean, and I used this expression yesterday. I was chatting to somebody that you know uh, advisors have been allergic to annuities. Really, I mean, like quite a visceral allergy. <laughs> <laughs> to a new news, but now that things like that are becoming more popular and also, you know, longevity is a real issue. We can't ignore the fact people are going to need their money for longer. Then we are going to need to model those things. We are going to need to be able to show them what that looks like. Um, it's interesting yeah. that you say that because um, when I was a power planner, uh, we used to use annuities a lot. Right. So the practices that I worked in used to recommend them. And it's interesting that they've dropped off yeah. the recommended list um, for a, a long period of time. I really have. It's great to see that they're coming back and they can give that yeah. uh, assurity to to clients. They, yes. And I think, look, we all need to acknowledge that I think Australians, I mean, we moved from time many years ago um, from a time where defined benefit was what you retired on. You didn't care how much the money was. You knew how much was coming to you every year mm. and you just lived on that, right? It was just – the and everyone was okay with that. <laughs> they didn't feel a need to know how big the balance was, how it was invested. And we have have got a little, you know, obsessed with that in that shift away from defined benefit. And so somewhere in between is always going to be the answer. And I think that's what these retirement income stream products are about. You know, it's – let's almost halfway this <laughs> – these people are just holding their breath every time they see the end of the news with the, you know, did the market go up or down? Is there anything else that you guys are seeing that could be an exciting part of the future for what you could roll out for advisors in this sort of space? Yeah, digital advice. Yeah. Uh, and I think too, as we look at the, the types of people, the generations that are going to come through over the next five or so years, uh, looking for accumulation uh, advice. Yeah to prepare for retirement and those who are getting ready for retirement. Yeah. Uh, and especially where where they may be curious and they're looking to understand what advice would mean for them, being able to have a digital advice journey that allows them to have some education along the way. Right. Um, so to understand what 
um, a retirement income stream might look like, what their super balances are and project them over a course of time. Yeah. And through that, have some financial literacy that then will allow them to find and connect with the right advisor. Yeah. Uh, and whether that's digital advice that drives lead generation for advisors. Right. Uh, as well as as advisors are thinking how their practices will evolve over, especially with these opportunities mm-hmm. that will surface, uh, how do they give advice faster? Obviously being compliant. Yeah. But also too, uh, focusing on your high net worth, that means you are leaving a part of the market out there in the cold. A huge part. And and for any profitability of a business, to be able to have a stream of potential clients coming through, even if they're going through a digital journey for just something specific, but to have them on your books, have the opportunity to engage with them and then lead them towards hopefully being a client that needs um, traditional advice yeah. and complex advice. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think um, – I remember for years I've gone to, you know, these conferences and they talk about, look, those people aren't your clients yet. They'll get there. But nobody really worried about how they got there. Yeah, how did you get there? It was like the poor client was just, well, future client was just left. Hopefully they'll get this stuff sorted enough. Yeah. You know, and we're seeing that a lot in the cash flow space. Um, For the people we're niching on, we've developed a cash flow offer because it is clearly the biggest barrier Mm. to them becoming a more complex client. And so if we don't resolve it, I'm not sure who does. You know, the banks aren't up for that, It's not, and understandably. Um, so you're right, we're going to have to consider what the experience is into your practice, and some of it will be something that isn't technically advice, you know, and our systems are going to have to be able to partner with us to do that. Yeah, and it's not just creating a, a, a pool of potential new clients. Um, it's also how do you grow your practice yeah. at around your people and what is the succession plan of the practice? And the, um, the research that we've uh, – put through and we've worked through, I think that gives pause for any practice to say, well, what's my next 12 month strategy to prepare mm. for this? And what's my five year, what's my 10 year strategy? Yeah. I know it can be challenging for small business owners where and advisors where they might be wearing multiple hats in a business. Yeah. How do they stop and, and take the time to work on the business rather than be in it? And to be able to create a pathway for their people to become the next advisors the research shows that advisor growth is only going to increase by 1.1% over the next five years. Yeah. Like that's staggering. Yeah. So how do practices use the opportunities in the industry that are going to come their way to grow their people, but also how do they plan for their own exit strategies? Mm. Do they stop being an advisor at some point, become the coach and the mentor for the up and coming yeah. uh, advisors? Definitely. And, and I mean, we're looking at that from, you know, if you can have different types of services and offers you have, that means you don't necessarily need advisors to do all of that work. And so you can be developing people in coaching that can then work their way up to advice. Like it lets you have that sort of pathway, which to be honest, for a profession, we're one of the few that doesn't have a very clear pathway. Mm. You, know, you go to any school careers day and the accountants have got their pathway and the lawyers have like, it's very clear what, what your options are. We haven't had that to date. And you're right. This is an opportunity to do that. It's interesting you were talking about, you know, taking a moment to think about the future. I think that's really important because we have been so, we've had to be so reactive up until this point. And it feels like, to me, I feel like it's about a decade of reacting. Like it really, since all of the early talk about, and I remember when there was a car, right? When it was the piece of advice and a couple of pieces of paper, I remember. (laughs) I think in those days, but well, the scary thing is, I remember when there were RBLs. Right, right. <laughs> remember the complexity. Oh my goodness! So you know, in it really does feel like we've all had to spend all our time reacting. So when there is a moment when you know a team like Iris and Deloitte have done some hard work for us into looking into the future, you're right. Taking a moment and going, well, what does that mean for our business specifically, our ideal clients? What might we do into the future? It's almost a gift in that sense because we haven't had that chance to date. We just, you know, fists up, trying to deal with everything coming our way. So I think you're right. This is a moment to take a bit of a breath and really get to reflect, you know, and plan for the future. Yeah. I mean, if I look at having been in the industry myself and then been watching it and and being involved on the sidelines through tech, uh, advisors and their businesses and the people in their businesses have not ever had a moment there's if it if it's not regulatory, uh, there's something else coming on the horizon. 
uh, there's no, there's actually no time to just stop and plan. Yeah, and that, and that is the key to having a successful business over the long Absolutely. term. Yeah, uh, and so when you are just reactive, you are in that, in that. I mean, potentially even sort of a flight mode. Absolutely, fight uh, or flight is for is absolutely real for a absolutely in a business. Yeah, um, and so for us, it was how do we give back to the industry? We've been a player for such a long time. How do we give back? How would, and and we knew that by doing this report and providing the benefits of the outcome through to the industry meant that advisors themselves didn't have to take the time or the money to yeah. actually do that themselves. Yeah, and it would be difficult, you know. I mean, the access to this, the sort of information you and Deloitte have managed to get their hands on, <laughs> you know, it would take us a long time and I'm not sure that I could stick with it the way the team and the team have done. Um, you know, it's their absolute bread and butter. We can't talk about digital advice without talking about AI in a bigger sense. The buzzword. Right. I mean, it's all about <laughs> audio. Um, and I'm actually curious on a number of fronts, fronts, and I haven't actually warned you I'm going to ask this question, so <laughs> it's up. But at, let's start with how you as a business internally are looking at AI. Let's not talk about how you are for your clients. Internally, how are you finding that journey? Because any business now has got to consider how you're going to use or not use things like Copilot or the equivalents in the tools you've got. So, how are you guys approaching that? Yeah, so internally, I mean, I think I think we had the same reaction to what a lot of advisors did when AI first came out. It was like this is going to replace everyone, yeah. um, and I think everyone's calmed down from that now yep. and realised that it's never going to replace a human, uh, and and certainly you can't replace the human interaction and the trust that comes from having a human interaction. No. Uh, but where we we didn't go full bore into it was because we know that there's a lot of data mm. and client personal information that yeah. is not only stored in our software being utilized by our clients, um, but you know we, we've got our own internal data and our own IP. So being the company that we are and um, you know cyber being very important to mm. us, we wanted to pause before we push forward really quickly to understand what that meant. Yeah. Um, so even if we develop it ourselves, having a strong cyber plan around that, uh, and if we integrate uh, right. with with others, like a right. co-pilot, yeah. you know, making sure that any we understand where that data is moving to, how it's being utilised, yeah. how it's being um, stored securely, and what does that yeah. mean for the advisor and the client. Yeah, um, I think that a lot of people jumped on the AI bandwagon and just started plugging in mm. and haven't stopped to think about what they've put in that and where that data has gone. Yeah, what doors have they opened into yeah. their business? Yeah. yeah. So so we definitely use AI internally as a tool. Yep. It certainly helps us to do reporting faster, to um, put scenarios and thinking around any of our strategic planning or goals, um, yeah. being able to utilize that to bring it to, into a succinct approach. Uh, you know, things such as we've got a huge amount of data that we have done through various reporting out to clients. So how right. do we make that easier to um, provide through them when they're going through their own audits Yeah, and they seek um, information from us? So uh, yeah, okay. we need to be able to provide that really quickly yeah. and succinctly. And so AI um, can, is helping us there. Uh, and then, of course, yes, we are looking at the product itself. <laughs> Look, and it's such an interesting the challenge that well the challenge i'm experiencing with ai is part of it actually comes down to creativity because we all i mean i saw a great post on facebook that said this ai stuff's great but can't somebody come and clean my house and and like and it, it's a valid point is like can, can't we just get the hard stuff sorted please i mean it's great that it all does these you know fun things and you can generate great posts on social media but really can't we get the hard stuff done and i and i think it's an interesting concept to be focusing on, well, not only can it, can it be efficient, and that's clearly where there's going to be a value add, like you say, getting a glimpse into the insights of the data without even having to analyze the data. I mean, that's sort of what AR can do, right? You leap a whole step. Mm. It's just live doing the analysis. It just is going to show you what you need to see, you know, which is quite magical, I think, and magical across an advice practice. I mean, there'll be themes, you know, you'll be able to start this, this data will start to be able to telling you things before you even asked it. And that's you where know. efficiency comes from yeah. because rather than have someone in the business sitting there thinking of what the question should be, AI should be coming through with the notification to say something's missing yeah. or something isn't aligning. So yeah. where we're looking at AI, uh, and, and this will start to come through in our roadmap very soon, we're looking at where AI can support the fact-finding process, yeah. uh, managing file notes, 
how do you take a file note documented conversation into the fact find really quickly and easily? Yeah. Uh, how can AI actually then have a look at your data and say you're missing key information relating to your client? Uh, you need to source that information. Yeah. Uh, it can also having a look to say, uh, for instance, you know, they, the client has said their expenditure is a hundred grand, but they only earn 80 K. Right. Like there's a big gap there. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, when, when someone's writing a fact find and sending it back, that should be just coming up straight away as an alert. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so that's where we want AI to help to guide them. Prompt, yeah. And, and just, then they can ask the right questions and, yeah. and engage with their customer better. Yeah. But also to manage their data better because data-driven decisions in a business is extremely important. Yeah. But if your data is not clean but you don't know where to look to make sure it's clean, yeah. um, that's a big challenge too. And look, to be fair, I'd say in our industry, particularly in advice, you know, for advice practices, we probably haven't really utilized our data well in that sense from a business perspective. You know, there, there would be, it wouldn't be a huge proportion of practices that would have really key insights into the practice capacity, um, blockages, like all that sort of stuff is not something that, that is innate or natural to us. And also it can be a bit hard to pull together. So I, you know, I completely agree. AI can start to just break some of those blockages, you know. I mean, I love the idea of somebody calls in sick in the morning and AI will be able to flag for us. Is there any particular client needs that should be addressed by somebody else or can we just wait? You know, all those little things that require a lot of work and you've got to go through their tasks and review and like all of that, um, when it's formulaic essentially what you're trying to do, AI is perfect. Yeah. You know? And then not having to have scheduled reports. I mean, yes. that, that is a function at the moment, but someone has to go in and build that schedule. Uh, to have a schedule that comes through and says, here's your list of clients who are getting heading towards retirement age, like right. just like AI to come and tell you that. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that's where AI as a tool is going to add efficiency into practices. Yeah. And look, I, I think and many, you know, iterations down the track, I'd love to see it. And it's probably going to be via things like client portals, but behavioral monitoring so that then you can be nudged to say that client hasn't logged in and done the thing they should have done in, in a month and a half. You might want to ring them. You're like all those things that can just help you keep somebody on track, help them get the result or the transformation they want. Um, AI could be beautiful for that. Absolutely. You know? And if you then even overlay it across digital advice. Yeah. You know, if you've got someone going into a, a digital advice journey and they're getting through the education component of that, but they're dropping out. Right. You know, what is it, is it, is there a theme happening across the clients? Is maybe then the, the, the journey's not resonating with them? Um, all of that will give an opportunity to pivot. Yeah, it really will. And and when you look at, um, I spent a lot of time in in e commerce groups and things like that um, internationally, and they spend a lot of time. Even bloggers will have a lot of paths and journeys they take the people through. And if they do this, they go there. That sort of stuff. And we've not really done that in advice. We have that. You know, it's this many steps. The client goes through those steps. <laughs> you know, whereas to start to get really clever about flags that then cause something else to occur means the support, like the unique experience that will feel like from the client's perspective, really I think could transform the way Australians view advice. Yeah, and you know? with, with digital advice as well, like everyone's unique and yeah. they all have a different, they're all thinking differently, their situations are different. Um, but at the core, there is a lot of similarities yes. about how we all travel through life and, yeah. and through our financial journeys. Uh, and so to have AI sitting across the top of a digital journey to actually come up and say, well, based on the information that you've put in, um, consumer, client, uh, then people like you are investing here yeah. and achieving outcomes such as this. Or people yeah. like you are working on reducing their debt. How? What are the sort of strategies that are considered for that? And then, yeah. you know, in an in a ultimate world, how would then we connect those people through those journeys to the right advisors, the specialized advisors right. that could help them. Right. And I mean, the niching in advice is something that I think is both exciting, but it's very new to all of us. Like you say, years ago, you know, if they could walk through the door, they were a potential client, <laughs> really. Um, and the opportunity to niche, and I think in financial services, we always look at these things from our perspective. So niching means, you know, oh, are they in retirement or not? Like it's about what we would do for them. Whereas I'm excited to see where people go with niching. You know, will there be an advisor who specializes on people that love to do international marathons and therefore they're organizing all of their life so that they can travel for blocks of time? And like 
that sort of resonance with a particular community, the way they think, what they love, the way they talk, I think that is exciting, you know, and that'll change with the way the user experience that we deliver. I think that's one way of definitely looking at it. Um, there's also, I think, when we when we look at the research as well, like natural disasters was is yeah. one of the big shifts that came out of our research. And I think I think back to when I started in the industry, making sure that someone was insured because their home might flood. Right. And you know, back then it was maybe a once off, but it happens almost every year now. Yeah. Um, fires. Uh. You know, we've come out of the of a pandemic of something that we never, any of us thought we'd ever live through. No. Uh, but the chances of a pandemic happening again is is still there. It's, yeah. it's high, yeah. um, especially with the amount of the population across the world and the way that we travel. Yeah. Uh, being able to be niche in how we do things, advice such as insurance. Yeah. And how do we help where people cannot get insurance? How do we actually uh, help advisors to specialise in helping their clients to be self-insured? Yeah. Um, you know, I think – there's there's one industry that I've watched um, from a personal perspective. You know, it's the hospitality industry. If we went back into a pandemic, and oh. it's not the only industry that was impacted, of course. But wow. But there's a lot of people who lost incomes. How yeah. do people ensure that income is just outside of the usual uh, vehicles that are used to protect income? Yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because, you know, advice, we're taught a lot about um, – volatility management, I guess, is the way you look at it from an investment perspective. But really, even though insurance or personal insurance plays a part in advice, we actually aren't, I don't think we're taught about risk management in a bigger perspective. And that's what we're talking about here is if you can't insure a home, then does that change even what you buy? Like, I mean, there's so many considerations to for the person to understand if you – like the difference between spending two hundred, four hundred thousand, eight hundred, that two million. If a $2 million home can't be insured, wow. Like that's an interesting choice for a person. And, and therefore, the person now that might buy that $2 million home, maybe those people, it wouldn't be a smart financial decision because if that got wiped out – they'd be done, you know, and it, currently that would be their single biz- biggest asset in the future. Is that going to be bad advice? You know, should they be reconsidering that? Yeah, and should should, should someone be seeking advice from an advisor saying, well, I'm actually planning on buying a home in this location for this much? Right. What does that mean? And should it, should an advisor be able to be educated to provide them, say, hey, you're in an area that we know, we've got research to indicate that it's flooded Let's three, talk about three out that of means. five years. Yeah. Um, what does that mean for you? Yeah. Um, because we do know that when people do want to buy a home and can buy a home, they're emotionally attached to Oh, my, you can't stop them. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> the walls are going down exactly. and it's still in. You know, so, but you're right to be able to, and, and this will probably play a part in the sort of data we're going to need. Mm-hmm. It is going to be broader than, gee, I need to be able to look at fund performance. <laughs> Yeah, that sort of things. We're going to need more data, like you say, localities. Um, there could be more collaboration with general insurers to understand the hot spots, the places they just won't go. You know, for an advisor to be able to tap into that in a sort of more immediate manner and be able to just because I mean we can't say yes or no to a client. What we can say is we can just make them informed. That's right. You know, and if this happens in the future, that's what your situation looks like. Do you want to start again from scratch at fifty five? Yeah. You know, and and the answer might be yes. That's okay, but they've made an informed choice. That's right. They know the risks yeah, as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And so data is a big a key strategy for us going forward. Not just data on, you know, funds right. and data feeds. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it it's also where can we source data that can come into one place for an advisor or the uh, the people in their practice to use to then to be able to look at themes and trends such as that and yeah. make suggestions or at least um, outline the risks. And there's going to be a bit of unpacking, isn't there, there, because um, there's whole groups, whether it's dealer groups or groups of advisors who sort of avoid the topic of property. You know, aside from it being a recognized asset that a client might have, their home or others, it is something that's sort of like aside from, and we worry about this and other people worry about that. Clearly, we're going to have to start unpacking that mindset because if the reality is there's people that are either are going to have a disaster that causes them some financial pain or considerable financial pain, we can't ignore those anymore. Well, you know, we, you're right. It, as, as long as we can, we can have data that we can have some confidence in, we can present it in a way that helps the client understand. We're still not pointing them to a particular property, right? If that's what we, 
get uncomfortable with. Um, but I, gee, we're informing them, you know. But there's also other areas. Like if we look at the younger generation, they where will they want to invest as they're leading into retirement? Right. Like we, a lot of younger people are investing in crypto. Yeah. Um, and that's not currently a product that could be recommended right. through advice. Let alone data fed into your yes. explanation model. <laughs> and it is interesting, isn't it? I've um, been watching this a lot and, and you know, my background is actuarial studies. And, and so, you know, analytical is the, my natural bent. And, you know, there's a whole lot of these new assets that people are playing in. And I understand why, because um, they're resisting corporates and infrastructure that they've just not seen serve them. And so it's natural to go for these things that feel a bit wild, you know, feel a bit out there. Um, I'm just not sure how long the advice industry can ignore this stuff. It's going to go on anyway. And if it's going to go on anyway, we need A, a way to incorporate at least acknowledging it, but also maybe better be able to express where it sits in all of the different assets, you know? And so you know, for me, when I've been joking around with some clients, it's like, oh, I put it right there with, you know, going to the casino, lots of fun, but we know we could lose a whole lot of it, you know, but, but you know, that's me being flippant, flippant going forward. It, these things are seen as, as assets. We can't ignore them. No, and people are going to invest in them. And if, if, if the industry is not in a position to be able to at least provide some guidance, yeah. then that increases the risk. It does. For those people. Yeah, putting our hands over our ears and eyes and just ignoring it is not going to get it done. Um, and I think what it's probably ignoring is the reason people are going after that. And I think, you know, the, the like you mentioned, emotional triggers with property, there's significant ones with things like crypto assets. Um, Australians do have a gambling gene we can't avoid. So, I mean, you know, crypto was always going to do well here because like, woohoo, another thing we can, we can bet on. Um, but, you know, I do think instead of sort of ignoring things, I think if we can factor it in in a clever way um, that shows some real value, why not? Yeah, and, you know? and that's where the industry needs support from the regulators as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, because yeah, that advisors, doesn't help, does yeah, <laughs> advisors can't do it on their own. Software, yeah. tech software can't do it on our own. Um, we, we do need that additional support to help to broaden that uh, and, and, and understand what that means and, and how advice would look like into those areas. And and I think also let go of some generational assumptions. I think perhaps the industry's gone, oh, it's not a big deal, only young people are doing it. We did a webinar for our clients um, and we had a couple of non-clients turn up and I had a lady who it turns out was in her late 70s comment that she'd lost a whole lot of money on crypto because her grandson told her it was a good idea. And I'm like, mm. Okay. <laughs> oh, bless. You generally trust the ones that you love to do right. <laughs> like, the right thing oh, for you. Um, but it, it's happening, mm. you know, so we've got to be ready for that. Now, I'm interested in collaboration was the theme of this um, episode of the podcast. And I know historically you and I have spoken sort of offline before this podcast about Iris's approach previously. Understandably, you had some super big clients that you needed to serve that I'm imagining sort of um, almost stole your open, your product roadmap from you in that it was like, well, it was we needed to build it for them and then look, it'll serve the rest of the advice market for, for sure. How has that shifted for Iris as a business? Yeah, I mean, Iris went through a few errors as it grew. Uh, so when Iris first and, and X-Plan first emerged on the market, it's, it, we were targeted and tailored towards the smaller practices. Right. Uh, and they were all our first clients. And I was with Iris as as that started to yeah. occur. Um, and, yes, then the larger institutions needed a solution, and so they took a lot of extra work. Yeah. Um, Which they do anyway. Yeah, they're, so they're big. They're big and complex. Yeah. Um, and so from there, whilst what we built – some of that was suitable for a smaller practice, not all of that. Then we went through our own expansion and we moved globally. Yeah. Uh, and we stayed structured globally, which meant that we were supporting product delivery across lots of different regions into yeah. the UK, South Africa, et cetera. So with our transformation, that has allowed us to reset. Okay. Uh, and for Wealth uh, APAC, uh, we are focused on Australia and New Zealand and we have now in my business unit, uh, our own customer facing team who are going through their change of service offering to ensure that that is meeting the needs of our clients, mm. uh, moving towards more of a SaaS based uh, service model. Yep. 
Um, we've also got our own dedicated product and tech team. Okay. So instead of sharing across the globe now, we have our own teams who are dedicated to producing a roadmap that is fit for our Australian and our New Zealand clients. And so that's where we are engaging now with our clients a lot more to get more feedback. Yeah. And I know there might be practices, advisors out there who say, oh, you've been, you've been doing that, saying you've been doing that for a while. Um, but we were had a global lens then. Well, and if you think about, like I'm just thinking about the size of that feedback loop when it was global, mm. like how would one request ever get addressed? Because <laughs> it's this huge pool of, of requests. I mean, if you're dealing with global requests for change in a product, I, that makes sense to me why it would be hard. Whereas if it is region focused, that makes a huge difference because you guys will start hearing themes. There'll exactly. be some repetitive requests that come up. Clearly that helps move them to the top of the pops and then you can start implementing that way. Right. And it allows us to have more targeted interactions right. with our clients yeah. and actually talk to them directly. Uh, so we're having our product team is actually out engaging a lot more than what they have in the past. Yep. Uh, they're having really in-depth conversations. They're running workshops with customers. Uh, we've got some consideration and plans for how we would run them more broadly. Right. So instead of just targeted in with specific clients, yeah. how would that be across a t um, client types? Okay. So if we've got... Uh, smaller practices, uh, one or only two advisors, their needs are going to be different from a, mm. a practice that might be a multi-site business. Right. Uh, and so we're keen to be able to start really engaging with them. But our feedback loops have been strengthened and that feedback loop means that those who put forward feedback through will, like, will get a response now. Yeah. And they'll have an understanding of where that fits into our pipeline of work uh, and our priorities based on how much it's being asked for. Yeah. And if it's not a good fit, we will provide a reason why. Yeah. So there's no more black hole yeah. at high risk. Feeling like you're talking into the void. And look, it's um, it's such an interesting, you know, accidental consequences are so interesting, aren't they? Thinking about, you know, and we did have in our industry these massive institutions that had a huge portion of even the advisors in the country, right? And when you think about how that defines what any tech provider was doing, it ended up being top down. So that means what the dealer group needs, what they need for compliance, what they need. And when you think about that, that then means like it's not the advisor isn't even last, the client is probably last, right? So to flip that, because that's not how even the industry really is structured quite that way anymore, you know, at all. We don't have those sort of big groups in the in the industry, then means that's how things like Visualize would have come about because now it's like, well, hold on. Who is the end person getting impacted here? It's the advisor's clients. So what can we do that actually adds value to them? So I can see how that would just naturally change how you guys would focus, you know, and where the um, these clever tech people can apply their energy. Mm. Have you seen any need though then, I'm just curious, about the type of, you know, developers or engineers or bodies you have internally? Has it changed? Have you got more you know, I don't know, UX from a client perspective, people, like has that all shifted internally as this sort of transformation has gone on? Yeah, and, and I mean, to be to be blunt, I guess it's still going on. So yeah. we haven't finished our transformation. Yeah. Um, but, yes, we have shifted the capability that we've got in our teams. Mm. And, and as we were talking previously about bringing new people in, yeah. uh, bringing new eyes and thinking in has actually opened up new opportunities for us to pursue that will support the industry. Yeah. Uh, we weren't originally going down a pathway of looking at retirement income products, uh, but uh, I brought in a very experienced person from Link. Um, yeah. So brought Jacob Chapman in as my GM of products, mm -hmm. and he has uh, surfaced these ideas through the engagement that he's had with clients. Yeah, found those needs. In addition, marrying that up with the Deloitte research right. to validate the thinking. Yeah, and now we're moving forward with it. Yeah, um, and so as we're as we're looking at what our roadmap, product roadmap looks like going forward. It's not just the feedback, it's marrying it and um, relating it back to the research yeah. and then the data points that we have because um, so then we can actually have a really good proof point mm -hmm. as to why we're doing something. And I think that's been the challenge in the past. Yeah. Sometimes our clients would have looked at it and said, well, Iris, uh, why sure are you why, doing yeah. that? <laughs> I can't see what the, yeah, what the logic is. And I think, you know, in, uh, collaboration is a great word to describe where you guys are really working to head because – Yes, we can, like you say, we can give feedback, oh, it'd be great if, or, you know, oh, that doesn't quite do what we need. That sort of thing is great. But also to have then from X-Plan and Iris saying, this is coming down the line, 
we've done this beta, we'd love you to play with it. And then advisor go, oh, I never thought of that. That's fantastic. Like I think that dynamic, that give and take is really powerful. I think that's when you get massive leaps. Yeah. And, you know, we're also, I mean, back to data as well. I mean, I'm a big data person. I love making decisions on data. Mm. Um, Having data that sits across our product and knowing exactly where people are using our product. Right. So seeing high usage means that we've probably nailed it. Right. (laughs) Um, If we're seeing low usage, there's something not quite right there. Right. Is it a part of the product that just simply isn't required anymore? Because the industry has changed. Yeah. Uh, and it might be a piece of functionality that has been around, say, for 10 years and it's not needed anymore. Yeah. So looking at that data and then understanding if no one's using it, should we be maintaining it? Right. Uh, we'd rather take our people and take them off of maintaining pieces of the software that uh, our clients aren't using right. and put them onto the new exciting stuff that allow us to bring innovation through in the product. Yeah. And as as you're saying that, I'm just thinking like AI, even in that space, you know, could be really powerful where – your team could see, like AI could say, they're doing this a hard way repetitively. Like a third of the users are doing four steps more than they need. So you can go to market just with education. Exactly. It's not even changing the product, just saying, do you realize you could just only click there and there and the job's done? You know, that sort of insight is really powerful too. But to have that actually surface in the product right. as someone's using it, as a suggestion. Did you realize, yeah. Did you realize that if you, you could do this in two clicks instead of five? Yeah. Yeah, because then the onus isn't on somebody to constantly be hunting that because mm. that's tough. They've all it got is. jobs to do, you know, and, and some people don't have that innate curiosity. I mean, I have that terminally, I'm t- <laughs> so it can get a bit distracting sometimes. But for lots of people, they're happy in their patterns. Um, but you're right, nudges, those little nudges, it's how every app has blown up, right? It's the little nudge you can give somebody to just gradually change behavior or habits. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, 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 you know, I look at having worked in practices – Practices can get very embedded in doing the same thing the same way for yes. many years, despite many again years. <laughs> things changing. Yes. So you know, sometimes and again, like practices would experience it as well. Bringing someone new in who who is learning a process and suddenly goes, "Why are we doing it like this?" Yeah. To have someone that challenges that, now whether that's a person or whether that's an AI tool, yeah, it's a good thing because it will create evolution. Yeah, it really will. What other opportunities do you see for how tech providers like, you know, Iris and financial advice practice can really ensure that, you know, tools in the future meet the needs of advisors? What other ways do you, I mean, there's clearly feedback, yeah. um, but what other ways can, can we all sort of collaborate together to really get this evolution happening for advice? Well, I think having specific feedback for us. Right. Because feedback such as this just doesn't work for us. <laughs> Does it really help? Uh, because we, we want to get into the nitty gritty. Right. Uh, so being very su- specific about the problem that they're trying to solve. Yeah. Uh, and, and then that helps us to understand the need. And then that helps us to understand how we can provide a solution. Yeah. So we really need to understand the problem. Yeah. And whilst we can have a viewpoint of that, we need those people who are rolling up the sleeves and, and in deep to, to give us that validation of yeah. thinking. Uh, so. And so, you know, collaboration is, as we mentioned, is really important. I mean, Iris traditionally hasn't collaborated in the way that we are today. Yeah. And being able to be partnering with Ensemble is really important for us to have that connection out to the users. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that with the space uh, going live now and I'm in there almost every day um, watching and and, um, watching the questions, it's really great to see people coming in and asking those genuine, curious questions. Yeah. Uh, because even those interactions help to drive our thinking. Yes. And I think, you know, it's so true. There's the the very specific, mm, this could be improved thing. But also if the practice takes the time, like we talked about earlier, to reflect on these trends and what it might mean, to then be able to give specific, well, we have thought about that for our niche this is what we're seeing could be a solution. Can we talk to you, Iris, about what that might mean? Then, because they're going to think about it, it's just another way that they'll look at it and that can be, like you say, more input to what you guys might need to develop because you can't come up with all these ideas. It's not possible. No, and we, whilst the Deloitte research, I feel practices, if they are utilising that to plan strategically, that should also help them to evolve their practice, their businesses. Yeah. And so that evolution, only they can we, can, we could sort of anticipate it and what mm. we think evolution will look like in business operations. Yeah. Uh, but they are, they are in that day to day. 
they are probably going to see some opportunities there that we are not. And being able to surface that back to us is going to be really important. I, I don't envisage a business, a, a vice business looking the same in five years' time in the way they operate to how they do today. Not at all. Especially not the ones who are su- looking to be successful, profitable, and to grow with the opportunities that are coming. Absolutely. And look, even if it starts, we've been considering this for uh, for us internally, even if it starts by bringing these topics up with your clients, having the conversation, well, we just read this report. And this is what it talked about. What do you think? Because they'll once again be in their shoes and their lens. They go, oh, my goodness, that's going to mean for my grandkids. Blah, blah. Like they'll just have all of these insights that just won't have occurred to us, you yeah. know. And so to have the – I mean, it, collaboration can happen at all levels, cool. you know. So to bring the journey the, – your even current clients or future clients on that journey with you, and if they can feel like they're building – that as well, then they're leaning in to an extent that probably in advice, we've never let them, we've never really brought them in-house to help them sort of build the solution. You know? Yeah. And I mean, the report and the research is public. We're not yeah. gatekeeping this. No. So if a, if an advisor does want to use it with their clients, they, they we, what, what an interesting conversation. Yeah, I'd love to hear yeah. what comes out of that conversation. Absolutely. I mean, if, you, if, if you're listening and you're struggling with your next client webinar topic, I think we just found one for you. Maybe just pick one of the themes at a time because it's it's a very deep report. There's yeah. a lot there to absorb, if, isn't there? If you were to read the whole report, it's 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 heavy lifting. Yeah. Um, you know, this is not a bedtime story. No. <laughs> um, but you know, my team as well is has already started to do uh, webinar sessions with various communities and practices as well to dig yeah. into the details of of the report. Obviously, doing an overview to start with. And then uh, the offer is always there to come in and actually dig down into the, one of the seven mega trends. Yeah, perfect. Fantastic. So, I mean, the best place for people to go is to the Iris Ensemble space. Um, like you say, you guys are all in and out of there, which is fantastic. I'm betting that is one of the places people can also give feedback. So I'm sure there's a more um, formal way through Iris, but are you guys comfortable that there is something that either a thought or some feedback you're comfortable people to do that on the Ensemble Iris space? Yeah, absolutely. I've got yeah. uh, We've got all our specialists in there um, monitoring and responding to the questions. Perfect. And so where there is feedback, they will take that and put that into our internal process. Love it. Uh, and yes, there are other, other ways that uh, so it's not just the one way. There are other ways. So we're yep. open to uh, gaining feedback in as many many ways as possible, as long as it's getting to us yes. um, and through any of the forums that we have, and even directly through their account manager. Yeah, perfect. Well, Kelly, it's been fantastic having you with us today. Thank you so much for sharing um, valuable insights. Uh, for everybody listening, I'd highly encourage you to join the conversation on the Iris space on the Ensemble platform. Also, think about making sure your team are on the space as well. You know, X Plan is used through many members of the advice teams. They all need to be seeing what's going on, understanding it, and being able to engage and ask questions. It's a great place to connect and really collaborate and get the support they need as we navigate these changes together. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I, it's a huge opportunity. I'm really excited about where the industry is heading. Yeah, me too.